Welcome to Ensuring Success 2016, or welcome back if you've already been with us for some of our sessions today. We are so happy to have you here, and we are thrilled to have this panel here today that's going to talk about the firm of the future. Uh, this session is brought to you by Intuit, and we are very grateful to have Intuit as a sponsor of this event. Uh, we can't do this event without the support of our sponsors. So before we get into the session, I have a few housekeeping things to point out for you. Uh, first of all, um, Regarding CPE, if this is the first session you've been to, I just want to give you a quick uh, summary of how CPE works. We will present three separate codes at the bottom of the screen during this session, and we'll call attention to them so you won't miss them. Uh, you need to write down those codes, and then at the end of this session or the end of the day, whenever you're finished with ensuring success, you can click the CPE tab at the top of this screen that you're looking at right now, and it'll take you to a page that lists all of the sessions that we're offering today. You can click on the sessions that you've attended and enter the CPE codes that you wrote down during those sessions. Um, that's how you'll get your CPE credit. The certificates will print out automatically. Uh, there are um, also optional evaluations that you can fill out for each session. Um, regarding us, we would like to hear from you, so feel free to contact us during the session and you can uh, direct questions specifically to the speakers or add comments or share your experiences. Um, you can reach us by email at info at ensuringsuccess.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter with the hashtag DecemberCPE. And you can also find us on the CPA Practice Advisor Facebook page. And we have people monitoring all of those outlets. So feel free to contact us there if you like. Um, I would like to introduce our panel at this time. We have four incredible people who are going to share some great stories and experiences and talk about the firm of the future and what that means to you. So next to me, I have Chris James and then Karen Collum, Jim McGinnis, and Jorge Alavarieta. And they're all going to give you a brief introduction to themselves, and then we'll kick off the session. Thank you, Gail. I'm Chris, and I'm an attorney and serve as general counsel for my family's business, James Management Group. We offer traditional accounting and tax services, but we've also moved into more advisory and consulting work as technology has evolved. I'm Karen Collum. Uh, I've been a CPA for 25 years. I run a sole proprietorship uh, here in the North Dallas area. Um, s serve mainly uh, small businesses, startup entrepreneurs, and then also do traditional tax preparation for the individuals. Good. Hi, my name is Jim McGinnis. I lead uh, product management for the ProConnect group for brands such as LeCert Pro Series and ProConnect Tax Online. And I've been working with the folks here for over six years. Glad to be here. And I'm Jorge Lavarrieta. I work in the product management group uh, for uh, ProConnect. I lead primarily our ProConnect Tax Online offering, and I've been with uh, working in the industry for the last 22 years. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Intuit ProConnect has been telling us for the past few years about how to build a firm of the future. And in, as a result of that, how to make a difference in the lives of your clients and how to grow your practice. So the advent of the cloud technology that we're all getting pretty accustomed to using has really changed everything and made this uh, an, an opportunity for accountants to engage with their clients in a new way, to perform services more easily, like e-filing. Um, and even connecting with just family and friends. Everything is different because of the way we're looking at technology these days and how it has become so immersed in our lives. Um, we use the cloud to better serve our clients than we did in the past. So not just serve them more quickly or efficiently, but actually provide them with better services, including insights and trends and things that we weren't able to do um, in the sort of look back mode that we were used to with preparing financial statements, showing what happened in the past, and now we're looking more into how our businesses are performing now and how they can be performing in the future and helping our business clients move in the direction that will be most beneficial to them. So um, what I'd like to do is just, first of all, let's define this phrase that we hear, firm of the future. So Jim, can you talk a little bit more specifically about that? Because of everybody I know, you seem to use that phrase more than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah, Gail, it's, uh, it goes back for a few years, about three years ago or so, um, 
we and others in the industry identified some trends, things like the move to uh, more data, um, move to social, the move to mobile, and then broadly this move to the cloud. Um, and so we really saw growth in QuickBooks Online. We started talking with accountants and uh, started to share that these trends seemed inevitable and it was important to move towards these trends. And the feedback was universal. Thank you very much, but can you be a little more specific and give us some help on what we really need to do? And that's where we worked with people, industry thought leaders like Ron Baker, who actually came up with the term firm of the future and, and gratefully let us uh, uh, use it. Um, and we divide it into three basic pillars. The first is the importance of getting online, um, how terrible it is to have all your data trapped in a little coffin underneath your desk and how relatively useless that is with modern technologies. So get your data up in the cloud where it's more secure and where it can be accessed for uh, you know, data analytics and some of these future technologies. The second pillar is become a trusted advisor. Um, we see massive time savings as the data just flows through the applications. And if you're serving the same clients, doing the same work for those clients, and it takes you a fraction of the time, but you're charging billable hours, you're, you're going to shrink, not grow. Uh, so we, we are big proponents of value pricing, fixed fee pricing, and becoming a trusted advisor. And then the third pillar is there's no reason why you can only grow your practice with just um, you know, your local community anymore. There's an opportunity to grow it, uh, not only across borders, uh, across states, outside your city, but even across borders to international. So the third pillar is, is using these technologies to help grow your practice. So that collection of three pillars, get online, become a trusted advisor, grow your practice. We kind of bundled up into this concept of firm of the future and then have been working with wonderful uh, uh, practitioners to help us refine those ideas using things like QB Connect to spread the message a little bit. Excellent. So uh, before we continue, we're going to drop the first CPE code on the screen. So take a look at the bottom of your screen, uh, make note of the CPE code that appears, and save that if you plan to collect CPE credit for attending this session. So. Um, Karen, can you tell me a little bit about how you've implemented cloud in your practice? Because you've been doing this for quite a while. Absolutely, I have. I started on a very small scale originally uh, with uh, Tax Online. It was actually my first application. Uh, it started very small with a number of clients just testing it out, seeing how it worked, and I really enjoyed it. So uh, I've been actually using Tax Online since almost its infancy. At the same time, I also then became a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, mainly for the marketing side of it so that you could be on the Pro Advisor website. That brought in some additional clients, but it also brought in the um, certification process. And that is how I became exposed to QuickBooks Online. And after learning about QuickBooks Online, I was able to identify a client that QuickBooks Online made perfect sense for. So it was a good friend and a, a substantial client that I went to and said, would you be willing to be my guinea pig and go on this journey with me to migrate you to the cloud? And he was more than willing to do the learning curve with me. We were able to migrate him. And he had five entities, so it was five separate entities that went over. Then I put my own practice on QuickBooks Online mm. because I am a firm believer in my practice that I cannot ask one of my clients to do something <laughs> that I myself am not willing to do for my own business. Mm -hmm. So once I put myself on there and was able to play with some of the functionality in a different model, I found that it was the way I wanted my entire practice to go. So then from there, I continued to migrate my business clients that were on desktop. Now, with new clients that come in, I will not work with them unless they're willing for me to take them to the cloud and set them up on QuickBooks Online and work that way seamlessly. And that's really a new mindset, because it used to be clients would come to us and we whatever they were using, we'd say, okay, we can serve you, and we ended up with you know, eight copies of different versions of QuickBooks <laughs> on our computers. Right. And so. Absolutely. It's made such a difference, and I think there are still those couple of clients. I would be lying if I didn't say it, that there is no desktop people in my practice. But those are the folks that I've had for about 10 years that are just not comfortable. But anyone new, there is nothing that stops us from saying, this is the way we run our practice, and this is how we're going to take you to the next step. Okay, so Jorge, we've, we're talking about the firm of the future. What about the ProConnect of the future? Where is it going? Well, I think uh, similar to the pillars that Jim outlined, I mean, a lot of the things that we're trying to do is really, at the end of the day, save people time so that they can grow or enjoy their time with their family, whatever they choose to use that extra time for. 
Uh, you know, I think where we're really going is, is, a, is an interesting place because to Jim's point uh, about the, uh, the data being locked in the desktop, while you could, in theory, have done a lot of work and analytics on the data that was within your firm to maybe improve the lives of your customers, the fact that the data, when you put it on the cloud, on that pillar, it is now, um, it can take advantage of the wealth of data, not just from your practice, but from everyone else to really um, optimize business outcomes, to provide really rich insights that can help you really make a difference for your clients. So once again, I think where it's going, it's, it's obvious, right? It's obvious that everything is going to the cloud and there's this tremendous benefit. Um, but I would say it's evolved from the initial belief that the cloud was seen as just, oh, it's anytime, anywhere, and that's the benefit. I, I think it's so much more than that. It's unlocking the power of data that really allows you to make a difference for your client's lives because we can surface these insights through really intelligent software. It's moving to a place where today you do tasks. In the future, tasks are going to be done for you, and then you can choose to take action. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, just a brief example. Uh, we've been talking about tax planning. Uh, in general, and how do we want to build a tax planner of the future? Do we want to build the same old thing that we've always built, which allows you to create different scenarios and projections, or do we uh, have to take on, um, or do we take the opportunity to say, no, based on what we know, here are various options you could provide your client. So while tax planning is still happening, you're no longer doing it. You're just choosing the case that is most advantageous. So it's, it's moving from a, I do work, to the work is done for me, and then I take action as an accountant. Um, I think it's a fundamental difference in, uh, in I think, in how firms are going to work in the future. So, Chris, what are you seeing in your practice? Well, um, going back to Jorge's uh, point, we've moved to PTO exclusively. This last year was the first year. We were originally using Pro Series, which mm -hmm. is a, a it's based in the coffin, and so yeah. made a hundred. PTO's ProConnect Tax Online. ProConnect Tax Online, yes, and so we may move to the cloud-based technology in order to allow us to both serve each other within the office, uh, better delegation of, of tasks and uh, workflow, and also serve our clients because we can now um, show them whatever we need, anywhere we are, in their office, in a car, and it, it just doesn't matter where we're at anymore because the cloud gives us the ability to uh, take the information with us. And as, as Jorge was alluding to, it's no longer trapped. We can use it however we want it. It's, uh, it's very flexible now. And so that, that's really what we've been trying to use the cloud for, is to increase our flexibility, increase the value add that we can provide the client, and just have better information at our fingertips no matter what. The last thing you want to have to do is, is tell a client, I'll get back to you, and they ask you a specific question that could be very important to them that maybe you just didn't anticipate going into that client meeting. Now it's very simple to just call it up on your mobile device. It's right there. So how, how good a thing is that? I mean, do we want to be tethered to our clients every single minute of the day? Anybody? I, I, don't, think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think just having the ability, once, once they ask a few questions and know that you're on top of it and know that you've got complete control of the situation, they're going to have faith that you're going to be that trusted advisor and look out for their best interest, whether or not they're in your hip pocket, so to speak, 100% of the time. <laughs> And oftentimes with their data in the cloud like that, you actually see it sometimes before they have noticed it. And that's, I think, more where the trusted advisor piece comes into play is that if we're on top of it and we see something that's happening, we call them before maybe they've even noticed it because they've been busy doing the work of their business. Mm -hmm. And therefore, then we can call them and say, we just saw this anomaly in your numbers and identify, is it real? Is it an error? Or what do we need to do about it? I, I love to think back to the old technology scale. Do you remember waiting for phone calls? Yeah. Right? You'd sit and wait for a phone call. We never do that anymore. It just, come, it just comes and we choose to answer or we don't answer. Often we text back. So um, I think it puts the power in the accountant's hands to decide when and how to respond depending on the urgency as opposed to, you know, calling, not getting them, having them call back. Not, you know, it's just, it's a better phone world. Tag. It's yeah. a better world. Yes, phone tag, that's right. All these concepts that I don't think my kids will ever understand. <laughs> <laughs> so how can a firm of the future, if you're adopting new technologies and being more accessible and um, watching dashboards and making analyses based on what's happening kind of in real time, how can that translate into added services for an accountant? Well, I think at the highest level, we think of it as advisory services, right? So <clears throat> what can you do to really help optimize a business versus just doing the books or just doing the payroll or just doing the tax return? 
Um, I think as things become more streamlined and the tax return process is shrunk from a 30 minute hour, two hour process to a five minute process, that gives you the flexibility to really help make a difference in your client's lives. And it really moves the accountant from a, uh, from a doer to a consultant. Um, and many accountants already do that today. They just do both. They do and they consult. And it's really hard to truly advise your clients when you're spending the majority of your time doing work. So I think that's just, I mean, that's a fundamental difference. And what are you two seeing in terms of additional services or different types of services that you're offering? And of course, we just, keep in mind, we just came out of a session where we talked about a whole hour's worth of new services that accountants mm -hmm. can be offering. All right. I, I don't know how much it is a different or just an elaborated uh, group of services more in the planning phase, kind of exactly to what Jorge was speaking to. Whether it's you identify and you're able to work with your soon to be retiring clients or even your clients that have just hit that 59 and a half level and looking at planning related to tax brackets. Um, but I don't, for myself, it's not as much additional. I mean, we've added some things like um, employee benefits consulting, working with another firm to try to give them a full package for the small business folks where they can come to one place and we can direct them. And previously, there would not have been the time nor the bandwidth mm -hmm. in order to offer something such as that. Personally, I think the move to the value-based billing has allowed us to offer more services from the advisory capacity because clients are more willing to call us when they have an issue without worrying about whether they're getting build for that 15 or 20 minutes worth of work, we're able to add so much value based on the analytics that we've accumulated and the access to the other data that is also collaborating with what we've provided to the cloud in order to come up with better solutions for our clients in a more timely fashion. The, uh, the only thing, a couple things I'd add, one is I think about my relationship at home. And when I go home and I've been traveling a lot or working long hours, it turns very transactional. Did you pick up the kids? Did you pay the bills? Did you get the car inspected? Whatever it is, uh, that doesn't help my relationship with my wife. It's when you move beyond the transactional and move to, to real conversations. And then I'll bring in what I learned about sales many years ago. Ask somebody what they need and then sell them that. You can't even have that conversation, Gail, if you're, if you're hourly billed, dealing with transactions. What, what we hope to do is free up the time uh, for uh, accounting professionals to have those meaningful conversations and discover what their clients need and then sell them that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, and I'll add one more, one more element. Um, you know, one of the key parts of our strategy is to help save accountants time, but it's not necessarily so that they can grow. It's actually explicitly called out for us that it's so that they can prosper. Reality is that uh, Karen may want to expand the services or go deeper on the services that she's already offering. She may want to offer less services. She may want to have more time with her husband. Um, so it's really about what you choose to do with it. There are certainly services that could be added, and, and, and I'm sure that when we talked about additional services, we talked about retirement planning, which is probably a big thing that's, that's coming up, especially with all the baby boomers and such. Um, but it's really about choice. It's about giving you the flexibility to move away from being that just tied to your desk at all times. What if you just went home at four and you finished that task later that evening so that you can spend more time with your family. Or if you choose, now that you've saved all this time, maybe I do go into consulting. Maybe I start expanding into tax planning. We, we don't know. Uh, but the reality is that our job is to just save the account time so they can choose how to use it most wise in the best way that, for them. Okay. And by the way, baby boomers are not going to retire. So, <laughs> 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 Ever. so we have a question from our audience about um, all this sounds great, except what if you happen to live in an area where internet service is not so great? Um, and you just perhaps don't have the ability to access all the tools that you're talking about. Um, how the question is, uh, how are clients who are not well served by the cloud supposed to survive if the emphasis is being placed on cloud-based applications? I'll just open by saying that desktop is gonna be here for a long time. <laughs> QuickBooks mm -hmm. desktop is gonna be here for a long time. Pro Series, LACERT, desktop tax applications, they're going to be here for more than a decade. And they are the best solution for many customers, including those that don't have, don't have uh, you know, great internet service. But the internet service is coming. And, and I remember talking about the cloud four years ago or so in large audiences. And 
you know, you were there, Gail. Nine tenths of the audience, you know, was from Shrek, pitchforks and and torches, <laughs> and they wanted to take the stage and tell me I was wrong, wrong, wrong. Right. Uh, we've come a long way. There's a long way still to go, but I do want to emphasize that desktop's no, not going away anytime soon, and Intuit is committed to continuing to support it, not only maintain it, but make sure that it's secure, compliant, and from time to time we add value-added features. And, and I'll add one other thing to your uh, to your question because I, I think that's obviously spot on. I think we 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 truly uh, realize that the desktop plays such an important part, and it's not going to be an overnight thing. It's going to be here for quite a long time. But you know, how do you deal with customers uh, that aren't willing to adopt these technologies that allow the practitioner to take advantage of these benefits? Um, well, that's into its job to figure out and help the accountant. How do we how do we help? use that person that may be on QuickBooks desktop, but then we still somehow get that data in a, in a, maybe in the cloud in a way that the ana analytics can still happen even on a desktop product. Uh, how do you deal with people that, um, um, well, I'll give you a, an example. One of our, um, one of the visions for ProConnect Tax Online is what we call uh, ready to review, to deliver a ready to review experience where all the data is digitally collected and uh, the data entry and data collection is gone, which is two-thirds of the time that an account spends in tax preparation. Um, well, that only works if the data is provided in a digital fashion by the consumer. Right? And if the consumer is not willing to adopt the portal, then how do we enable the accountant to take the data that's been dropped off at the office and put it into the system in a manner that they still get the benefit mm -hmm. and they can continue to support their client in the way that is right for their client? but they can continue to uh, see the benefits or, or get the benefit of the ready to review experience because we enable them to put that data in on behalf of their clients. So that's, um, that's the other side of it, which is we recognize that you have customers that are not gonna move uh, and you have customers and maybe the new ones, you can be more adamant about, hey, this is the way we do work. Uh, but quite honestly, that's our job to solve. How do we deal with the fact that our customers are dealing with two different sets of customers? And it's not a problem that's unlike the one that we face. Uh, because we have customers that are on desktop and we have customers that are online mm. and we have to manage that transition and we have to manage how do we help our customers work in that manner. Um, so I think that that's also an important aspect of into its role in helping the practitioner get those desktops people to, in, in some way, shape or form to still experience the benefits that we're trying to deliver through our cloud applications. Um. I want to go back just for a minute. Karen, you mentioned something uh, about the QuickBooks certification process. And could you just tell our audience just a little bit about what that entails and what the benefits are of that? Absolutely. Um, when you sign on to be a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, there's a series of both continuing education and that are CPE credit uh, type classes and just other education that allows you then to take tests, become certified, whether it's in desktop, enterprise, it's in all of the offerings around QuickBook. It's, QuickBooks itself. Um, once you are certified in any of the different uh, versions, then you can be on the Find a Pro Advisor website. And what that allows is a uh, individual who's doing their own <coughs> bookkeeping to be in their QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks desktop application. And they can click on an icon that says, do you need an accountant? And then your profile will come up stating what either your uh, client base industries are, uh, where you're located. I've ended up with a number of clients through that just because of my zip code, um, you know, because they were just looking based on location versus what are the industries that you tend to serve. Mm -hmm. um, the certification process is not that difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a, a bit of a time commitment, but as far as the, the education that's provided allows you to pass the test. Mm -hmm. So it is not a difficult uh, process to go through. And then you can also use it in your marketing materials outside of the ProAdvisor website as mm -hmm. well, which I have also utilized and have found um, to be beneficial. Okay. Um, so Chris, can you share some stories about how um, your advent of moving into more of a cloud-based practice has made a difference in the, the lives of your clients or in the relationship you have with them? Sure. Up until 2009, we were still housing our own servers. We then moved the servers to the cloud, but it was still kind of, the data was still kind of housed. It wasn't really much of a difference. We just weren't, didn't have physical boxes in our office. We then made the move to QuickBooks Online for the majority of our customers. And what that has allowed us to do is not only um, keep track of the numbers, but we've been able to pull in different pieces like a bill.com or a ProConnect tax online in order to 
allow the data to move around and migrate from, from process to process efficiently. And what that's allowed us to do is empower our clients to control the different pieces of the process that they want to still maintain control, where we're basically quarterbacking the entire process. And so what happens is everybody, everybody is happy and the, and the data is flowing seamlessly from one application to the next. And so it's really made everybody more efficient in what they do, which again frees us up for more time to analyze what's going on and make recommendations to our clients. Okay, and how do you do that analysis? We take a look at we various dashboards. We try to uh, try to get away from the traditional model of here's your financial 30 days after the month ends and really get in front of it and what having those applications giving us information, whether it be through their AP process, whether it be through the payroll process, we can see information as it happens real time as opposed to waiting on historical information to come to us in a, in a file at the end of the month. We can, we can be there real time with them every step of the way. Um, we're going to take another break here. We've got a message from Intuit ProConnect to share with you. Uh, as soon as that's ended, we will display the next, the second CPE code for you for this session. So we will be back in just a minute. Hi. Hello. Hey, QB. At the Lobster Shack is a new customer. Congratulations, Naomi. And done. Great. And can you invoice them $30,000 every month starting today? Absolutely. What are you delivering? 500 loaves of sourdough every morning right as they open. Wow, that's your biggest deal ever. At that price, your profit will be 5%. On average, it's 17. Is this okay? Surprise I had to go with to get the deal. Go ahead and send it. Oh, and let Charlie know about the deliveries. Okay. I added their opening times to his calendar. Hey, QB, let's look for some ways to increase the margin. Well, with your increased volume, you could buy flour in bulk directly from a miller. If you went with simple flour milling, you'd save about 10%. What's that tally? About $13,000 a year, or 3,000 of those half-calf, no-whip mochaccinos you like so much. Right. And what's the downside? You'll have to pay up front, and that means you'll be short $4,202 for payroll next week. Uh, are any options to cover? Working on it? Yes, I found three. Borrow on a few invoices open a new line of credit, or take an advance from your credit card. Hmm. Let's see what Stacy thinks. Playing a message from your accountant. Good job, Landon Lobster Shack. Since they're gonna be a recurring and high volume client, I think if you switch suppliers and go with simple flour, you'll be fine after the first month. To make your payroll next week, the cleanest and cheapest option is gonna be the loan against your receivables or your open invoices. Let me know if you have any other questions or if there's anything else I can help with. Hey, QB, you got that? Working on it? Funds will be available by Wednesday. Plenty of time to make Friday's payroll. Thanks for the lift. You're welcome. Hey, QB, you sure are popular. I serve over 10 million businesses around the world and speak 37 languages. But I'm never too busy for you, John. <laughs> All right, so I just picked up another 15 bucks. How much have I made driving versus designing this month? With driving at $22 an hour, you've made almost $1,100. With designing at $50 an hour, you've made $700. And I'm going to finish up the toy store job tomorrow. Could you let them know their new logo will be ready in the afternoon? I marked your calendar and notified them. Sounds good. Drive safe, John. Thank you. We're back. And we'd like to call your attention to the bottom of the screen where we are going to display the second CPE code for this session. So be sure to make note of that. Keep it with the first code, and there will be one more code coming in order for you to get CPE for this session. 
So we have a question from our audience about uh, that talks about comparing the functionality between QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop. Um, this person points out, for example, I can't look at the balance sheet and the income statement at the same time in online, and I'm not getting reports in the same manner online as I did in the desktop version. Um, also, uh, he, still, he or she still bills by the hour and feels additional time is being required by using QuickBooks Online. So uh, what do you guys think about that? Ooh, I love questions like that, Gail. Yeah. <laughs> um, first, thank you very much. And, and, you know, our intent is to save time. And so it makes me feel kind of bad when I hear that there's something in our offerings that, that aren't saving as so much time as they could. Um, what I'll say is, you know, QuickBooks Online is still an evolving product. Uh, desktop has been out there for more than 20 years, and we polished and polished and polished it till it was, it, it's, a very, it's a great program. It really is. And we have made so many improvements on QuickBooks Online in the past five years, particularly in the last couple of years, that I think that we've um, moved away from a lot of those areas that were frustrating our accounting professionals. But they're not all gone, and there's still some. And so thank you for the feedback on this one in particular. Um, all I'd say is it's important to look at the totality, that there are some areas and some features that may be a little bit slower. But our goal is to speed you up in the overall. So I'd love to hear from our practitioners um, that one issue, do you face that same issue? And is it big, small, relative to the overall time savings? I face the same issue. And mm -hmm. I have just found that the more you work in QuickBooks Online, you end up figuring out how to work around that. Whether it is simply a matter of download it as a PDF and look at it, you know, the one report for separately. Um, the, the issue does exist, but I have not found it to be something that sucks down time. Um, there's so many other efficiencies within QuickBooks Online that have saved me time that I've gotten used to the fact that I can't look at both simultaneously, and it's become a non-issue for me at this point, personally. I, I agree, absolutely. As, as Jim said, the overall process has been sped up to the point where there may be a, a slight inefficiency in one small area, but the overall process is much faster. And so I think uh, there are workarounds, there are ab abilities to um, manipulate the system to where these things are possibly seen side by side. We'll keep working to knock those back though, Gail. Thanks for the Excellent. feedback, we appreciate it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've got a question for you, Chris. What's your advice for people who are thinking about making a switch, a transition to the cloud? Like you, you did a three-step process from desktop to hosted to cloud. Um, is that the best way to do it? Or if someone's still on desktop today, desktop software, and trying to determine what's gonna, how to, what kind of change to make, what's your advice? I think the first thing is to be committed because the cloud is where it's going. That's just the bottom line. And so when we switched from housing our own server to moving the server to the cloud, that wasn't really much of a change. It was moving from our server into the software as a service, the QuickBooks mm -hmm. Online. That, that was our move to the cloud. And what it, it's a firm culture. You have to have the commitment as a group to make the change. And then I would make a, a, a small change, uh, as Karen said. Take a client that you have faith is, has been with you for a while that you really know is going to be suitable for a baby step. Uh -huh. And then do it, figure out what works, what doesn't and then keep making incremental changes, and then uh, in a year or so, you'll wake up and you'll be in the cloud completely. <laughs> yeah, I think also it's important not to try to do too much all at once. Um, I think the biggest mistake you can make is try to do three things at once, and then you do nothing well. Um, I believe you find the pain point in your practice. Identify what is that one thing that we would love to fix and find the proper cloud solution that fixes that problem, start there. And it's amazing as you continue to then evolve with it, you identify the other cloud applications that then fit your practice, and then you build your practice in the cloud the way it works for you. Because what works for Chris isn't gonna work for my practice, is not gonna work for someone else. And it's really tweaking and just taking the time slowly to work with each piece and then start building an ecosystem that makes sense for your practice. Okay, so you are the guys who are providing us with all these solutions. Is there a downside to continuously moving ahead with the software that uh, that people are choosing to use? Um, I don't know. Could you help clarify? What do you mean by the software that people continue to use? 
Well, what, whether it's uh, accounting and tax software or just anything that's, uh, you know, workflow, anything that's making their practice apparently more efficient on the surface. Um, but we're always moving forward. And so do we want to always move forward? Do we want to find a stopping point? <laughs> um, should we have gone, to, have we gone too far? You know, is there a point that will be too far? You know, what's, is, is it always going to be great or is there maybe a downside? Well, well, I believe uh, fundamentally that if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, I, for one in the industry, there's probably this uh, element of people or some people that believe that accountants, for example, are slow to adopt technology. And I, and I actually fundamentally disagree with that statement. Accountants are very methodical in their decision making. And, and that is because what they're dealing with is highly sensitive data. It's important information. It's other people's data. It's not their own. Uh, but I think what Karen just mentioned is exactly the way to go. It's, it's take a step. I've seen people that jump all in and make it work. I've seen people that jump all in and struggle. Uh, but I think the key is take a step. Take a step mm -hmm. in because if you don't ever take that step, to, uh, to Chris's point, um, you have to have some level of commitment. If you don't believe it, and you're never going to do it. And if you don't try it, you're never going to get to experience it. So take a step forward, no matter how big or small it is, uh, and see how it can benefit you. If you find that um, you know, you're struggling with it, maybe stay with it a little bit. You're going to have to push through change. Uh, but I, I see it as a positive. I don't see any negative uh, repercussions of moving to the cloud. I'm, I think we can all look at our own lives and, and see how the device that's stuck in my back pocket right now that I, I would rather... Uh, I think I'd rather lose my wallet than my phone, <laughs> uh, which is ridiculous, uh, has, has radically changed our lives. And I think people just need to realize that once you take that first step, you're going to find benefit that you never imagined was even there. Because as, as I mentioned earlier, people often think about the cloud as anytime, anywhere, no installs, right? lower hardware costs. I'm like, that is the periphery. That, that's the stuff on the edges. The real benefit comes to some of the things that you're experiencing, you know, boundaryless workforce. The benefit, hey, you have a problem staffing? Well, you're not going to have that big a problem staffing when you can have staff working remotely. Clients, you can find them all over the world. They're not just restricted to your zip code. Um, but I think you've got to take a step forward. I think you've got to take a step forward, and it can be daunting, and it can be difficult. Um, but talk to your peers. You know, don't. You don't have to listen to me. Go talk to your peers that have done it, that have taken these steps, and you got to be bold and, and, and take a step. Absolutely. I, I read a great article in the Wall Street Journal a few weeks back that talked about technology and reminded us that in 1979, IBM sold a 64-bit chip for $40, so about a buck fifty a bit. In my pocket, I have an iPhone that has 128 gigabits. <laughs> I'm a billionaire, right? That would have it would cost billions of dollars to have that much computing power in 1979. Um, it just keeps getting better. You also, wouldn't have been able to fit it in your pocket. I, no, that well, that, that was the the other comparison is that uh, you know a, a digital equipment mainframe computer took up a whole room, yeah. required air conditioning, had all the wires under the floor, and uh, cost a million dollars. And now the laptop, you know the 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 device you're using there has faster processing than it did mm -hmm. by a factor of a billion. I mean, it's unbelievable. No, we're, we're, it's, it's going to accelerate. It's going to get better. There will be risks. We will manage the risks together uh, and learn from each other. I'm excited. Okay, well, speaking of risks, um, one of our attendees asked a question about security issues, and we're actually going to do a whole session on security later this afternoon, but uh, can you just in general address any security concerns people may have about using totally online products? Absolutely. Uh, we take security very, very, very seriously um, for obvious reasons. Our, our livelihood, into its livelihood, requires absolute maximum security protection. Uh, all of our stuff is you know, well beyond bank standards. Um, uh, just give you an example, as we're moving to AWS and the public cloud, we haven't moved entirely there yet. There are government agencies that are there, uh, but we want the code to be harder. We want security to be harder than what they require. Um, but then, you know, you get into comparisons on these things. And, you know, my laptop is sitting uh, in the trunk of my car right now. I, I'm not sure. There, in fact, I'm quite confident that's less secure 
than the data that we put up on the cloud. Uh, we have every interest in making sure that it is as secure as it possibly can be. Um, and so I, I, do, I do believe that the cloud is more secure today than what you may have laying around your office. And I agree with that as well. And, and, and it is a joint effort. This isn't something that um, Intuit alone will solve. It's every vendor out there uh, working with uh, our government and working with the IRS and the new security standards that are being put in place. Um, certainly there's a risk, but there's, there's a risk of data uh, being stolen out of your office as much as there is risk of uh, somebody hacking into the cloud. And, and let's be real, the bad guys are out there. There's, there's bad guys out there. there. There's no denying that. I think it'd be foolish to deny that. Um, but to Jim's point, we invest so much. And we invest so much in security because it is part of our customer's livelihood, our livelihood as a company. Um, and we work diligently with the government agencies and with other vendors to ensure that we, that we protect uh, the data that our accountants quite honestly hold so dearly too because once again it's not their data it's their customers data and their livelihood depends on it so we all have to come together to make sure that we mitigate these risks and uh, I think we've done a tremendous job as, as seen by some of the statistics um, um, that have been shared by the IRS in terms of the the fraud reduction that happened last year after we put in place a lot of security uh, measures across the industry um, so a lot of people we know are still using desktops and uh, you made reference to the the prisoners or the prisons of data on, on your floor or under your desk. Um, and I, I can attest to the fact that uh, people are still using older versions of QuickBooks because as an author of many QuickBooks books, mm. the book I still get royalties on every single quarter is using QuickBooks 6, mm. which is the 1998 mm. version of QuickBooks so people cool. are still buying every quarter. And so I love it because nobody else has a book on that version in print. So if you want it, that's well, where you get it. But, but that said, so what, what are the risks that people should really know about, just in a nutshell, if they're still using desk, desktop and all their data is in that machine under the desk? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily frame it as risk. I, I, sometimes I give presentations and I ask people to raise their hand how many editions of QuickBooks are they running and usually a, a good friend of ours, Stacy Kildall wins. She says she runs I think nine <laughs> different ones. She's probably out there saying, no, 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 Jim, it's ten. Um, you have to run, you have to run the QuickBooks, you have to run a separate uh, computer that runs Windows XP. Right. I, I don't know what six ran on, Gail, but um, and and then a client comes in and you need it to was, work them up. It was DOS. It was DOS. Six was DOS. <laughs> my God. So somebody's out there running a computer on DOS with, with QuickBooks. Every quarter it's, I sell this book. And uh, <laughs> so a client comes in like that who hasn't seen an accounting profession in a long time and you have to step them up. We support things for three years because it just becomes too hard. So then you have to have all the different versions so you can step them up three years at a time. The wonderful thing about the online software is everybody's using the same version all the time. And when we improve it, we improve it every month, not every year and everybody who's running it gets that improvement worldwide every month. It's just, um, it becomes clear how much faster we can bring time savings benefits to our accounting professionals, and it becomes clear how much easier it is to maintain uh, that. So again, uh, I would encourage folks to continue to upgrade to the latest editions of desktop so they don't get left behind by you know, some of the compatible software and operating systems. Um, and then when they are ready to move to the cloud, I think that they'll find that they can move all those old uh, computers to the Computer Science Museum in, in <laughs> Menlo Park or wherever. You know, I'm gonna add to the, 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 the data being trapped under your desktop. Um, there's, a, there's risk beyond theft, right? There is, uh, and I'm, I remember a story, and it's very unfortunate, of a couple of customers that were calling us after Katrina. Uh, and they were calling us, asking us if we had their data because they e-filed right, through our system. And we said, well, we have the e-file data, but the e-file data is not gonna help you. It's not the data that you need. And there was no way for them to recover. Uh, you know, I, I didn't keep up, unfortunately, with those two, um, those people. I don't know if their business survived. I know that we helped them at the time um, a little bit. But the reality is that it wasn't theft in that case. It was a disaster. It was a natural disaster, and that can happen. And a lot of people 
have a tendency to even back up their desktop data and the backup sits on their desk. I've been to their <laughs> office and it's like, this is, this is defeating the purpose of the backup. You have to have this offsite somewhere else. Um, so, you know, what advice would I give to those people? Be very diligent about how you back up your data. That's very important. It's the livelihood of your business. And, and it's uh, data that's incredibly important that's for your point. clients. Back it up and do a good job backing it up. Don't just mm -hmm. back it up and leave it on your desk. Uh, take it off site. Um, so that's one piece of advice that I would give. Google. It's great advice. Okay, we're going to um, display the third CPE code at this point, so be sure to take note of the number that will appear on the bottom of your screen. That's your third code for getting CPE for this session, if you so desire. Um, so what trends are we looking at in the future? We're talking about the accounting firm of the future, or the, the future, the firms of the future, so what about beyond the future that you can see right now, what's out there that we can look forward to? Well, the one I get really excited about is uh, this concept of machine learning, wow. where, the, where the, the offering improves with the machine. Give you a great example, we've launched Trial Balance into QuickBooks Online Accountant. And uh, we did our best job working with our, client, our, our clients and our customers to figure out how best to map the data from the books to the Trial Balance and then on to the tax. We did our best, um, but we've already heard from many, many accountants that we can do better. And so we've been improving it, but there's a human being that has to have the conversation and figure it out and change the mappings, and it gets better, little by little. We're working on and we're dreaming of a future where the machine itself does that. So it watches what all those accountants are doing out there. Every time an accountant changes or customizes the mappings, that goes into the machine. The machine says, well, that's happening a lot. Let's move that direction. And over time, it, it, uh, it learns itself to give the optimal experience for each of the accountants. That's just one example. With all this data available, um, there will be many, many more examples where the offerings improve themselves as opposed to having uh, poor, dumb human beings have to do it. So. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you probably hit on my top one too. I think machine learning or, you know, even the example that I brought up earlier about tax planning, um, the fact that actions will be done for you and you will just have to choose which ones to accept, which is partly based on machine learning and algorithms. It's partly based on leveraging data to provide, uh, you know, different scenarios in the case of tax planning. I think that's, it's, it's incredibly exciting where we're going. Um, and quite honestly, the sky's the limit. I mean, we're starting to look at other things, um, you know, virtual reality. How's that going to impact uh, our businesses in the future? Uh, you look at bots and, and how they have just popped up like crazy overnight, uh, where bots are intelligent and actually behaving like humans and talking back to you and giving you information. Those are things that we're exploring. I think those are, those are things that you can still see. They're not that out there in the future. Quite honestly, I think a lot of the things that we talk about today as firm of the future is really firm of today, um, with a little bent on, um, or the firm that could be today. Mm -hmm. It's just firm of the future because that's where we need people to start moving. I mean, it's, it's, it's where they're going to experience the greatest benefit, uh, but there's so much more coming. And, um, you know, machine learning, Pokemon Go is an incredible <laughs> app that does, has done some I really check. interesting there's things. I didn't probably some in here. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Karen and Chris, what are you seeing, in, or what are you? imagining in terms of the future of client services and what trends do you expect accounts are going to be seeing in the way they uh, provide services to their clients in the future? I'm going to let you go first on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, going back to uh, the machine learning, and we've done some, some hypotheticals envisioning the firm of the future, the 2020 vision, and a lot of it revolves around voice-activated technology and, and, and having uh, your... QuickBooks or having your, your tax program talk to you, uh, interact with you, uh, give you insights based on what the machine has seen across not just your client information, but across the board, across everybody that's working in your industry. And I think that having, you know, having somebody right there by your side every step of the way as a digital virtual assistant is going to be extremely exciting. And as it evolves and gets more powerful, it's going to be a great tool for the practitioner to use. I think mine tends to uh, revolve around the use of your mobile dev device and what data can it pull in while you're in the process of doing your everyday business. Um, I know the QuickBooks Self-Employed right now is going to start tracking the miles 
for your self-employed person is how often we, we go to a client and they don't have a mileage log. But now because of the apps and because of the accessibility of Wi-Fi, it's automatically tracking what this client is doing. And not really in a big brother kind of sense, but in an efficient sense that allows us to serve them, help them, and they, it just seamlessly gets the data gets to us. So I think it's the, how that mobile device continues to make our life easier and more efficient. Mm.